Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to another clinical problem solvers like our prof has days. Good afternoon, morning, night. Uh, today I will discuss with Rabi. My name is Amanda. I'm from Brazil for who don't know me. Uh, I am a six over team member. And today I will discuss with Rabi and I am so excited and we have uh, Ombesh with her first case. And until I introduce her, I want to invite you to present your case if you want to present and if you have any case, but you know you don't you don't know you don't know how to perform us, you can send an email to us for us help you. So Ombesh, please can you introduce yourself? Sure, thank you so much, Amanda. My name is Umbish Tino, and I, I, this is my first case presentation with Dr. Ravi and Amanda, but I've presented one case before as well. It was with Dr. Ravi, and I'm really excited to be here with you guys presenting my second case, and I'm an IMG from Pakistan. I've also applied for my internal medicine residency match this cycle, and I'm just so happy to be doing this with you guys. Oh, you guys are amazing. Um, Amanda, do you remember what your first involvement in VMR was? Do you remember? Yes, I remember. It Tell was us. Um, my first, I am a little What's crazy your first because, memory? Yeah. Because uh, first I, I, I joined to the Sipsovers and watch one session in the next session i was presenting case yes it's crazy <laughs> but ooh, let's present case and my first case it was about ketoacidosis diabetes and it was amazing and um i learned a lot and i think um in the past for amanda in the past and first uh sip -sovers, for Amanda now present, I think I can, uh, I could grow up a lot. So uh, I am very grateful for this community. And I love when I remember the memories that are what I passed here on Sip Sovers meeting. Yeah, you know, uh, I, um, I was so excited and I've been thinking a lot about today um, because I really, um, I really find Amanda as one of the most inspirational people I've ever met, uh, in large part because um, she's so open about her struggles and her struggles to learn medical English and her struggles with um, the hardships that I think everybody feels. So Amanda, I don't think you're different than anybody else, but I think what's so special about you is you're open and honest about what everybody else probably feels. And I find it really, really inspiring um, to be here. And I I was sitting here thinking, you know, I little, prepare a little bit of like what I'm going to say about the person I have the privilege to um, discuss with. I always try to make it a little bit personal, you know. And I was just thinking, I remember your first ever case in VMR. And I remember you sensing, sensing that you were powering through the barrier and you were like struggling in front of us, but you were fighting it at the same time. And it reminded me of our last discussion, um, how you felt the same thing discussing for the first time. And instead of shrinking and hiding, you came back two days later to discuss again in Academy VMR, first ever Academy VMR. And so I think it's incredible now, Amanda, that you not, aren't just a CP Solvers team member, um, I think you've inspired so many more people than uh, than you realize. And you're a leader in CP Solvers. Amanda does so many things. I think uh, she's most famous with working alongside Omaima as part of the case review committee, which she plugs all the time. Um, but she does so many different things. I can't think of something that Amanda isn't kind of already involved with in CP Solvers. So it's really, really cool. You know, and I think it's really fitting that um, you're here as leader of the case review committee and your buddy Omaima is here too. Um, and somebody who's gone through that process, Amrish is here today. Um, it's really, really cool. Um, so um, 
big gratitude to you, Amanda, for all the things you do. And similarly to Ambish for um, joining CB Solvers VMR only a few months ago and making such a prominent impact already. You know, I think your name is very well known to people here for your uh, really intriguing case. I don't want to spoil it. It was a very interesting cardiac dilemma. Um, so I'm really excited for what you have in store today. We're ready whenever you are. Thank you, Dr. Ravi and Amanda. So before I get started, I wanted to ask if it would be okay if I came up with an imaginative name for my patient, just for the sake of, you know, continuity. Yeah. I, I like to tell my story and I want to, you know, relate to it as well. Would that be okay? Yeah, of course. All right. So I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan and I came up with the name Tywin Lannister for my patient. <laughs> so I'm going to get started with my <laughs> first alicorn. <laughs> All right, so Mr. Tywin Lannister is a 79 years old male who <laughs> presented to the ED with shortness of breath for one week. So that's the presenting illness. And then for the history of presenting illness, Mr. Tywin Lannister has a known case of rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to have to control my reactions now. I can see everybody laughing already. Anyway, so Mr. Tywin Lannister is a known case of rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis related ILD, but he has not required home oxygen all of this time. And for the past week, he has had increasing shortness of breath with a productive cough. Normally, he produces phlegm in the mornings, which lasts for about one hour. But for the past week, the duration has increased. But of note, he said that the color had not changed. The duration had increased. And then he's also had fever spikes during this time. And his fever would go up to 101. For that, he would take Tylenol. And this would relieve the fever. But then the fever would spike again. And uh, he was also feeling weak and lethargic during this time, and he was still functional. But lately, he's been noticing that even if he takes a walk for, say, about 50 feet, say he's taking a walk from his sidewalk to his home, he felt like he had to stop to catch his breath. So that's what I have for the history of presenting illness and moving on to the review of systems. Uh, in the ED, he reported that he's had no chest pain, no hemoptysis, palpitations, orthopnea, or any paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. He said that he hadn't noticed any lower extremity swelling, no presyncope or any syncopal events. And other than that, he's had no recent history of any upper respiratory tract illnesses, no sick contacts. He has not had any headaches, and he denies any bleeding in the form of melena or hematochesia. And there were no significant um, uh, joint pains or any flares related to his rheumatoid arthritis symptoms. Um, Apart from that, he did complain that he's had a lingering right calf pain, which has been going on for well over a year. And this pain has been consistent when he walks, it goes away with rest. And on further inquiry, he said that he did undergo some vascular studies in the past and they did not reveal anything significant. The remaining review of systems was negative and that's about it for my first aliquot. I'm gonna give you guys the mic. Thank you so much, Ambish. Amanda, that was a lot of information, right? Yes, um, I'm yes. curious, before you tell us what you're thinking, what um, did what stuck in your mind about this case? Um, uh, what comes to my mind in this case, um, it's an uh, uh, elderly patient uh, with short mm. of breath, breath and with some uh, symptoms that remind me pneumonia. But yeah. if I will start off the beginning, like short of breath, how could I uh, approach this? So shortness of breath makes me think in two organs, like the lungs or the cardiac, uh, the heart. So uh, I need to know more information uh, about these patients like exposure, uh, use tobacco or not, because I can think on COPD problems, asthma and or other symptoms uh, that makes me remind me the lung and pneumonia. But uh, I just think about the heart and the heart attack or maybe heart failure that makes me think uh, about shortness of breath and these two organs. And uh, I've learned with you about how to differentiate in these symptoms uh, and what, it, what say about what organ it's, it's about the orthopenia 
And I think the patient denies orthopenia. So if the patient denies orthopenia, maybe we can think more about the lung disease and uh, uh, the patient have a, a previous uh, history of um, illness or lung disease like interstitial lung disease that make uh, think us about fibrosis. I don't think, I don't know. But initially, this is my thoughts. Absolutely superb. I think people were so easily to follow your thinking, which is shortness of breath equals heart or lung first. And then here you said the lack of orthopnea and the presence of known underlying lung disease from ILD is pushing you towards the lungs. And I completely agree with you. Let's now study one other thing, the fever. What does fever do for you? Uh, infectious. And maybe it's an infectious problem uh, that that could be happened uh, in the organism. Superb. Excellent. And now, where is where is an infection more common? In the lungs or in the heart? Oh, in the lungs. Yeah, it's exactly. This more can, common. Exactly. It's a very, very... Um, a concerning case for a inflammatory, likely infectious problem in the lungs. And now one final thing we should talk about is you did not talk about the calf pain. And I agree with you that we should not really focus on it too much, but let's explain why. So why did you not make a lot of significance compared to the first part of the calf pain? I don't know because I think it's not a uh, uh, specific symptoms and may may not related to the short of breath maybe. Hundred percent, I agree with you. We should first have a reflex when somebody points to their leg, and also says, "I'm shortness of I'm having shortness of breath," and the reflex should be DVT, deep vein thrombosis, causing pulmonary embolism, but. When we hear that the patient has exertional pain that's been there for one year, it's hard to imagine that there is an immediate relationship with what's going on now. And what I really appreciate that uh, Ambush is doing with her case is she's presenting it authentically. Poor Mr. Lannister has been suffering from, I can't do this, <laughs> uh, has been suffering from this calf pain from his many battles. Um, and so I think um, what's really hard about real life and what's easier in VMR is most of the time in VMR, the case presenter removes all the distraction for us and writes a beautiful HPI to help us come to the answer. In real life, the patient doesn't know what's important and what's not important, but the case presenter knows the answer. And so here, as you all practice, um, hopefully presenting your cases with the help of Amanda and Omaima and their team, I'd encourage you to keep the HPI authentic to what happened so that we go through the struggle that you all did about trying to figure out what's signal and what's noise. So I think the calf pain is temporary noise. We should update our thoughts on it if there are, if uh, more information corrects us. But I agree with you. I'm not thinking about it right now. Finally, Amanda, we should talk about RA, rheumatoid arthritis. So in general, what can you teach us about your knowledge of rheumatoid arthritis? So it's an autoimmune disease um, and that uh, have... Jo joints, I think, uh, articulation joints uh, with problems. And it's a disease that could cause a systemic inflammatory in the other uh, organs of the body, including the lungs. <laughs> Amazing. And what do you know about the lung involvement? So uh, the lung, actually, I don't know if we have like... Uh, pleuritis like we have in the lupus but I think uh, the patient with uh, a 
uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it's an immunosuppression person. So uh, the problem with the other organs, uh, including the lungs, uh, could cause opportunistic disease. Excellent. Absolutely superb. Um, I think that um, the, um, the labeling as rheumatoid arthritis, as an inflammatory disease of the joints, is a great place to start to learn this disease. But as you become more knowledgeable, like Amanda, you update your one line sentence about this disease and you no longer call it an inflammatory disease of the joints. You call it a systemic disease with a predilection for the joints, but three other <clears throat> common locations of disease. And those common extra articular locations are right here. <clears throat> the skin, rheumatoid nodules <clears throat> are very common. ILD, which we'll talk about later, serositis, and then some other things, namely coronary artery disease. <clears throat> so if you're just beginning, it's fine to call it a systemic arthritic disease, <clears throat> but the real manifestations of this disease are it's a systemic disease with a predilection for the joints, the skin, the lungs, and the serosal surfaces. And you're seeing this patient already having lung involvement. <laughs> Any questions about that, Amanda? No, no. It's very clarifying. Okay. All righty. Uh, Amish, do you want to tell us more? Yeah, thank you guys. So um, for the second aliquot, I have the past medical history for this patient. And I've already mentioned that he was a known case of rheumatoid arthritis and he was diagnosed with RA related ILD five years ago. And then other than that, he's not been on any medications for the ILD and I'll come to his remaining meds in a bit, but uh, he was not on any home oxygen. We've already established that. He's also been a known case of hypertension, coronary artery disease and DVT. So for his home meds, he's been on home which is an uh, which is a monoclonal antibody known by the name of adalimumab, I suppose. And then he was on a pixaban, and he was also on amlodipine. So those were his meds. And as for his family history, it was non-contributory. His social history revealed that he does not elicit any drugs. He's a non-smoker. He does not drink. And that's what I have for the third as for the second aliquot. If you would like, I can move on to give you guys more information. Otherwise, I can stop here. Oh, I think it's a great place to stop. Uh, Amanda, what jumped out to you? So, uh, first, uh, it's a immunocompromised patient. <laughs> we have uh, correct answer for this. And the DVT, it's a chronic DVT uh, because the patient uh, use anticoagulations. So, it's not acute. And about the the exposure, so uh, it's not a tobacco tobacco use a smoker, so COPD uh have made a little bit more uh chance that that the the patient can have. Absolutely amazing. And then um, with the immunosuppression, what did that do for you? Uh, with the uh, immunosuppression, so uh, like I, I, I said about the opportunistic disease, so and with lung compromisation, compro with problem, lung with problem, uh, I think about uh, fungus and some other non-typical uh, types of pneumonia maybe and with this 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 chief complaint 100 percent. i'm really glad that you mentioned that um that you're thinking about fungus and other opportunistic infections what do you think is more common in an immunocompromised person a normal infection or an or an opportunistic infection what's more common i think it's more common opportunity infection. <laughs> yeah, you know, let me show you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, let me show you. So, 
in an immunocompetent person, we think about viruses, bacteria, parasites, and fungus. What your what the reflex is, is when the patient becomes immunocompromised, we shift our focus to other viruses, other bacteria, other parasites, or other fungi. What we should do isn't to shift. What we should do is expand the possibilities like here. So it's still more common to have the same infections here in an immunocompromised person, but now we have to add so many other things. Um, what's different? The difference mainly is that the common infections now are much more severe. So as an example, the most common cause in HIV patient of pneumonia is strep pneumo. Streptococcus, most common. But what's different? The rate of strep pneumobacteremia is 10 times higher in a patient with HIV compared to in a patient without HIV. So here, Amanda, we still have to keep focus on the common things, but now we have much, much more work to do. By the way, I think this case is personally written for Ashutosh, who presented a case of RA and another autoimmune disease together. And now I just learned that he is on a, uh, a, a infectious disease rotation. So I know you're scribing Ashutosh and we greatly appreciate it, but I'm sure this case is perking your, uh, your interest. Yeah, this sounds like a really interesting case. <laughs> I've been enjoying this case so far. Amazing. All right, Ambish, tell us more. All right, thank you, guys. So for the third aliquot, I'm going to dive into the vitals in the ED. So uh, for the vitals, I have the heart rate. First of all, uh, Mr. Lannister's heart rate was 108. He was tachycardiac. His blood pressure was 100 by 60, and his respiratory rate was 30. So he was tachycardiac and tachypneic, and then he was also hypoxic. His, he was saturating at 86% on room air, and we immediately put him on three liters of oxygen. Moving on to the physical examination, the patient was alert and oriented, but uh, Mr. Lannister was unable to complete full sentences. And then for his examination, I'm just going to talk about the pertinent findings. His pulmonary exam revealed crackles all over the lung fields. Down just a little bit. Sorry. Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Down a little bit. There, Ashutosh is ferociously trying to keep up with you. <laughs> I, I must. My bad. I, I tend to talk a little fast. That's I'm totally try okay. To no worries at all. <laughs> okay, so uh, for the pulmonary exam, we were able to appreciate crackles all over the lung fields. We did not appreciate any murmurs. We did notice trace bilateral pitting edema, and he was in mild respiratory distress. And I've already mentioned he was unable to complete full sentences. He was hypoxic. The remaining exam was unremarkable. And I can stop here if you want. Ooh, Ambish is throwing us a curveball here. What do you think, Amanda? So, and with the physical exam, the pulmonary uh, with crackles could uh, help us and think about um, maybe, I don't know how to say, but um, problems in the lung, um, maybe interstitial or in the IORs and about the edema maybe we have a, a, a problem with a chronic problem with the DVT or uh, maybe problem with uh, circulation or heart problem Yeah, I agree. The edema is now confusing, right? Because Amanda, you were like, it's lung. I promise everybody it's lung. And now you have edema. So you have to slow down a little bit. But if you uh, if you look closely, it says trace, which means... So look at the hypoxia. The hypoxia is like... And the edema is... So 
maybe the heart, maybe. But I think you should continue to keep the momentum going uh, for uh, your lung hypothesis. So now, Amanda, the question for you is, <clears throat> right now, this patient is sitting in front of you. Would you give him antibiotics or would you wait? What do you think? Uh, I think I I would make wait because uh I need the ex the exams and maybe the the antibiotics can uh could not give a pre precisor exam you know so I will ask first labs and maybe uh a uh, a culture of of spawn. And maybe after I will start with antibiotics. Excellent. Okay, so let's talk about this. Uh, I'm trying to make Yusuf and management reasoning people proud, okay? I pro probably fail. So, uh, Amanda, in in um, the U.S., United States, we give, this, we give antibiotics in two different categories. One is called empiric, E-M-P-I-R-I-C. Empiric antibiotics means I have not confirmed the patient has an infection, but I'm very worried. Empiric. The other uh, category where we give antibiotics is confirmed infection. I diagnosed the infection and now I'm going to give antibiotics. So in this, in your experience, when do you give empiric antibiotics? Meaning you don't know for sure if the patient's infected, but you give antibiotics. What have you given? Uh, if the patient needs insects. Yes. Is this patient, <laughs> is this patient in sepsis? Yes. So I will start with empiric <laughs> antibiotics. Yeah. Yeah. So this, there's really, um, let's talk about why. We only give empiric antibiotics if we think the patient is too sick to, um, to wait until we know for sure, or we are pretty confident. So there are three reasons to give somebody empiric antibiotics antibiotics. Three reasons. One, sepsis. Two, neutropenic fever. And three, rigors, shaking chills. Each of these scenarios are either high risk for decompensation or high probability of severe disease. So there may be more examples but in thinking about what I have done to give patients empiric antibiotics, it's for those three things. But if the chat has more, I would love to learn from you. But those are the times where I've done it. Three reasons. Sepsis, um, uh, uh, um, uh, neutropenic fever, and rigors. Shema is asking, what about isolated meningitis? So that falls under the confirmed infection. It is true what Shema is alluding to, that we give a lot of empiric antibiotics in suspected meningitis. Most patients with suspected bacterial meningitis, in fact, in look, looking at this recently, almost 100% of them meet criteria for sepsis. So they usually are febrile, tachycardic, super white count. Bacterial meningitis is, su is not subtle. The patients with viral meningitis are usually systemically well, and often do not meet criteria for sepsis and often do not get empiric antibiotics pending the LP. Really good question, Jim. But if for some reason you're worried about bacterial meningitis for whatever reason and your patient's not septic, you're right, Shema, you would probably give them empiric antibiotics. Anyway, that's for Yusuf. I hope you watch this later. Give yourself a pat on the back for inspiring us to talk a little bit about management reasoning. But let's get some more diagnostic information from Amish. <laughs> 
All right, guys, I'm loving the discussion so far. Uh, very interesting thoughts. So uh, I'm just going to dive into the labs and imaging findings. So we did the CBC and his hemoglobin turned out to be 8.6, which has been close to his baseline. Other than that, his WBC counts were 3.6, his platelets were 84,000, and his BMP revealed normal electrolytes and creatinine. As for the BNP, the, base, be, be the brain natriuretic peptide, that was 205. And then I am going to share my screen and show you guys his chest x-ray. Amanda, are you having a heart attack? Okay. <laughs> what do you okay, can you guys see that? Yes, it looks great. Thank you, Amish. Yes. What do you think? I, I can try, uh, but what I'm saying here, it's maybe we have a pulmonary edema. Oh, no, first, first, opacities, extensive opacities, uh, bilateral, and uh, interstitial infiltrated, and uh, could be think about pulmonary edema or some problem like pneumonia in the in, in the interstitial so interstitial pneumonia or pulmonary edema yeah no i completely agree, completely agree with you i think that if you look at this you know now that there is likely an alveolar infiltrate because you're getting no. consolidations um uh, you see these consolidations. What's really, really interesting about them, Amanda, is that they are uh, bilateral, right? Both sides. Um, on And there seems to be relative sparing on the left lower side. And um, especially in the left, uh, <clears throat> uh, in the left upper lobe, you have relatively rounded consolidations. I want you just to remember that word. But if you look at the left upper lobe, the highest consolidation is fairly almost a circle. See that? But um, that's maybe a clue, but maybe it's not. And we'll talk about it if it turns out to be helpful later, but pay attention to that. But you're seeing a pacification. So that's a consolidation and it's bilateral. And simply, um, this is fluid. And the question is, is this fluid edema? or water? Is this blood? Or is it pus infection? Amanda, what do you think this is? Blood? Pus? Water? What do you think? I think it's water. No. Why? Why do you think it's water? How can I explain this in English? But... Water, no, because we, uh, if it was water, we can nivellate it. Yeah, um, if, <laughs> I want to emphasize what you said. Pulmonary edema, the no. clue to the presence of pulmonary edema is plural effusion. There's yeah. no plural effusion. No, no. Right? so maybe, uh, maybe pus or blood. Blood, yeah. um, blood, I don't know if had. Not history of MOPTs. Yeah. So why blood? So poops? I think so. <laughs> I think this is very likely to, to be pus or inflammation. And I think the question is, is it infectious inflammation or is it other forms of inflammation for sure? I think that's the question. Um, I just want to make one quick point here. A chest x-ray is great at diagnosing three things. Heart failure, bilateral interstitial infiltrate with vascular congestion and pleural effusions, community, community acquired pneumonia in an immunocompetent patient, and three pneumothorax. So heart failure, community acquired pneumonia in an immunocompetent patient, and pneumothorax. This patient had a z um, essentially zero possibility of either of those three things. 
that tells you from the get-go that the value of CT scan in a patient is very, very high. So unless you are confident that your patient is heart failure, cap in an immunocompetent person, or has um, pneumothorax, you're probably going to end up needing a CT chest unless your patient's not sick enough to need it, like a patient with a COPD exacerbation. So here, the value of a CT is going to be through the roof if those resources are available. Um, awesome. Ambish, you also gave us the CBC that I think we should have Amanda think about. Do you remember the CBC? Yes, I I, I saw pancytopenia. Oh, yo, yo. What do you think about pancytopenia? So, pancytopenia. Let's think about this patient with pancytopenia. I think two possible for this. Uh, we have the infection and the infection, uh, it's causing problem in the bone marrow or we have a new problem and it's a bone marrow problem. Wow. You know how many years I've studied pancytopenia and I've never said it so simply? I'm both oh, happy for you oh. and a little mad at myself. That was amazing. So you said infection, bone marrow problem. Final question for you. Can you connect pancytopenia with rheumatoid arthritis? Um, I think uh, the no. <laughs> I I think I I know what I need to answer, but I know how how. But oh. maybe the the arthritis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, could uh cause problem in the bone marrow. Yes. Yep. The term for um, rheumatoid arthritis directly causing um, uh, blood count issues is something called Felty syndrome. Have you ever heard of Felty? No. Okay. Well, totally new. Uh, yes. I, I, I don't think you're going to hear more about it today, but make a note for it, you to read about it later. Okay. We'll talk about it later. Felty. Okay. All right. Ambish, tell us more, please. Guys, I'm so impressed, Amanda, with your thought process. Honestly, it's amazing how you're able to process all of that information so quickly. I'm honestly impressed. And with the chest, with the extra impressions, I think I didn't even feel the need to read the impression because you guys were right on point with, you know, whatever you saw. We do see bilateral patchy opacities. We do see interstitial infiltrates. And I, we were all thinking along the same lines as you guys are at this point. And I'm going to go ahead and give you guys more insight. So his LFTs were within normal limits. And by this time, we had decided to send his sputum cultures and as well as his MRSA nares, urine strept, as well as urine legionella. And from this point on, I'm going to tell you guys whatever happened over the subsequent days, right? So on day one, as you all wanted, we had started Mr. Lannister on empiric antibiotic therapy, and we had put him on ceftriaxone as well as azithro. And we also gave him Lasix 40 mg IV once because of the edema and you know what we saw on the x-ray. So we went on and started to diurese him as well. After that, uh, and I already mentioned that on day one, we had put him on three liters of oxygen. So this is all that happened on day one. Now we waited, you know, for the next day, the next morning, uh, we had the results. And we also saw that uh, Mr. Lannister had deteriorated further. His oxygen requirement had increased from three liters to now six liters. So we were kind of worried and he had not shown any improvement in the 24 hours of the antibiotics that he had received. So what we did was uh, we decided to kind of change the antibiotics because we also had the MRSA nares and the remaining tests, all of them came out to be negative. So we discontinued. So uh, by the way, I think I haven't mentioned, we had put him on a uh, wank on day two. I'm sorry, I missed that part. Day one, he was on ceftriaxone and azithro. Day two, when we realized that there was no improvement, we put him on a broader spectrum course and we put him on cefepime, wank, as well as azithro. And when we had the MRSA nears and all the other labs that came out to be negative, we just discontinued the wank. And from this point on, we waited another 24 hours. And I'm gonna move on to day three. 
So day three, we had to put him on a face mask because his oxygen requirement had increased to now eight liters. So by this time, as you all have already mentioned in the chat as well, we decided to order a CT chest. And at the same time, we consulted pulmonology and they recommended some additional tests. And I would like to engage you guys in the chat and see what further tests would you guys you know, want for Mr. Lannister. And in the meantime, I'm going to move on to what happened on day four. So uh, on day four, we had shifted him on a high flow nasal cannula with 60 liters by 80% of inspired oxygen. And I can show you guys the CT. We had the CT by now. And if Dr. Rabi wants, I can also read the impression. Otherwise, I would, I would be interested in what you guys yeah. think is going on on the CT. Of course, so Deborah. Again, Hello, Deborah. You're joining us right in time for a CT scan. Go for it. Um. Okay, so we have the CT. I hope you guys can see it. Okay. Interesting. And so you have a representative image, huh? Is that, or do you have a couple of pictures or one snapshot? So I have two. I can okay, actually yeah. show you the second one, but there's not much of a difference I between see. the two. Okay. To read the impression. Amanda, what do you see here? Let's give it a quick try. Deborah, come here, my friend. Unmute <laughs> your mic and tell us what are you seeing. I'm kidding, but I'm just uh, keeping watching about uh, seeing about uh, infiltrating and effusion. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think that there's definitely an infiltrate here. And the question is, can we apply a little bit more um, specificity to the info? I'm trying to uh, pull up a good classic image. Let me see if I can find it. Um, one second. One second. So, um, um, there's... Uh, on on the right lung, so left screen, you see a consolidation. Okay, um, it's a little bit so it's peripheral, and it just strikes me that it's in such a rounded manner, almost circular. That's the one that's closer to the bottom of your screen. The consolidation that's closer to the top of your screen is almost circular. It's almost like it's in a ring. And um you'll see that in the middle, it's more dense as if it's a consolidation. And on the outside, it's a little bit less dense. The outside, technically speaking, is called a ground glass opacity. Okay? It's less dense than the middle. This might be representative of what's called the reverse halo sign. You don't need to know any of this, really, but to know that the consolidation, the dense part, is fairly circular, and um, he uh, and you see that there is denser material on the inside, followed by lighter ground glass material on the outside. So, um, yeah, I think this CT is very, very interesting, and at the end of the day goes to show you the power of CT scan in patients who are immunocompromised, both to look for infections and to look for signatures of inflammatory pneumonias. Very, very powerful. You also see dilated airways centrally, which depending on where you are in the lungs are suggestive of bronchiectasis. You do see, I can't tell if it's traction bronchiectasis or if it's regular old bronchiectasis. So long story short, I think our radiologist can help you solve these cases tremendously. Um, so we'll lean on you, Ambish, for what the actual read was. All right, guys. So I'll just read out the impression to you guys. And here, I would also like to mention that this case was quite interesting for us because we reached to two 
particular diagnosis. And I'm almost reaching the first diagnosis that we had for this patient. So the impression reads a focal area of consolidation in the right lower lobe and bilateral irregular nodular opacities in a centrally lobular distribution. And given the history of pancytopenia, which Amanda had already mentioned, so this is something that I skipped earlier on. Uh, this patient has been a case of chronic pancytopenia, and you guys already picked on that without even me having to mention that. So this history and the findings that we saw, this could represent infection, including an atypical infection, organizing pneumonia, which could also be considered. Given the patient's history and these findings, it could also be related to rheumatoid arthritis. And then uh, we have another thing that says that increased in the reticular opacities in the periphery of the lung. No definite honeycombing is identified, although there is significant motion. Amazing. Um, this is super, super helpful. At the end of the day, in a case like this, you really, really have to be worried about an infection. Um, and Amanda, I'm curious, have you ever heard about organizing pneumonia before? Organizing pneumonia? No. Yeah, Never. it's a very, it's very, very rare condition. It's basically like an abnormal reaction in the lungs. Autoimmune diseases are the first or second most common cause of it. But basically, Amanda, it's a form of interstitial lung disease, ILD, and it's one of the few forms of ILD that can be acute and serious. One of the few forms by itself that can be acute and serious. Most of the time when a patient is presenting acutely with an interstitial lung disease, it's because they have an infection or they've had chronic lung disease, idiopathic lung disease and are flaring. So here, I think the question, Amanda, for us is, is the patient having an unusual infection, like you said, opportunistic infection, or is the patient having inflammation in the lungs from rheumatoid arthritis? Also, like you said early. So how do you think you will, if you're taking care of this patient, what do you think you would do next? Uh, I will ask some labs like, um... RCP, I think it's important here. Yes. Yep. And maybe um, test HIV, yes. uh, inf uh, other infections, maybe can help us too. I completely agree with you. I think we are here. Whenever somebody has acute respiratory distress syndrome, this is more, the patient is sick from a pulmonary problem. And what happens on day one, like Umber said, we always give the patient antibiotics and we maybe die them. step one. Step two for treatment is, you really should think about steroids and stopping the trigger. So Amanda, I think we are between step one and step two. The question is, are we giving this person the right antibiotics or do they actually need anti-TB medicines or anti-fungus medicines or do they need steroids? I'll tell you what I would do in this patient. I would probably start him on steroid while waiting for those tests to come back. Why? It's very interesting to me that this patient seems to only have a lung problem. Did you notice, Amanda? We haven't talked about the kidney. We haven't talked about liver. So if we're thinking opportunistic infection, they're usually very severe and they have problems everywhere. It's very unusual that a patient with an opportunistic infection only has manifestations in the lungs. Do you understand, Amanda, what I'm trying to say? Yes, yes. 
you know, if we're saying this is an opportunistic infection, why is it not going in many places? Right? So we have to then say, okay, are there any opportunistic infections that just affect the lungs? Now, this is a attending a level question, Amanda, but I know you like to try. Ah, uh, yes. So, and Deborah's rooting for you with a big smile. So, can mm -hmm. you think of any opportunistic infection that just affects the lungs and doesn't go anywhere else? I think I there there is I think two. Um, yes. How I don't know how to say. It. No problem. You know, most species yes. that you know, Varsi uh, and perfect. Aspergillus. I yes. think it's the two that oh, I know. Excellent. Fungus, 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 fungus. 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 That's what you should think. PJP, Aspergillus, mucormycosis. Best example. Muco. This CT scan does not look like PJP. PJP is diffuse ground glass opacities. This CT scan also is not perfect for, for aspergillus or mucor, but maybe the central lobular nodules, maybe, depending on some more things about them. But the TNF blockers don't usually increase the risk of uh, aspergillus and mucor, not so much. So this case is probably not PJP based on the CT. It could be mucor, it could be aspergillus, but this is not quite the right kind of immunocompromising condition. And this patient could have organizing pneumonia. This CT is very good for organizing pneumonia. So that's why I would give the patient steroid because he's crashing. And I will wait for the tests of all the infections but especially the tests of aspergillus and mucormycosis. So in many cases, this patient um, will probably get advanced testing for those infections. But I just want to teach you one thing. This is not just all the opportunistic infections. This is the opportunistic infections restricted to the lungs, fungus, 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 fungus. And don't forget, patients can die can die of inflammatory diseases of the lungs. And if they are, it's usually organizing pneumonia. It can be very fast, very quick. So that's why I would give this patient steroid. Any question about that, Amanda? No, no, no. Okay, really nice job attending, Amanda. <laughs> attending class is jealous of you now. All right, Amish, tell us more, please. All right, so Dr. Ravi, hearing you talk, I can actually imagine my attending talking to me about this case. And he said and did exactly the things that you've been saying. And we did uh, go ahead and we start the patient on steroids. And this is going to be the last aliquot. I'll tell you what we did, and then I'm going to reveal the diagnosis. So for Mr. Lannister, I've, I've, I've talked about how he kept deteriorating so much, right? And at this point, we, we, the, we had consulted pulmonology, and they had recommended those additional tests. And you guys have already mentioned those in the chat. So we went ahead and we uh, did his urine and serum histoplasma and blastomycosis. We did his serum beta D glucan and galactomannan, as well as his sputum PCP, PCR, and HIV, right? And this patient was so hypoxic that we did not want to make him go through with the bronx, so we held off on that. He was too sick to undergo that. So at the same time, we had empirically started him on TMP SMX while we were awaiting the result. And we also put him on steroids, so we started him on uh, methylpred 40 mg BID. right? So while we did all of that, we were waiting for the results, and on day six, his beta D glucan came out to be positive and his PCR was also positive. But when I showed you guys the CT, uh, guys the CT scan, I also wanna talk about how 
by that time our my attending and the entire team that i was shadowing they believed that this like dr rabi had also mentioned the ct scan did not uh, sort of go with the picture of pcp pneumonia and we were bent on the fact that this patient has cryptogenic organizing pneumonia because the ct scan was you know aligning with all of that and that's the impression that we had and as you guys know uh, that the mainstay of treatment for cryptogenic organizing pneumonia is in fact steroids right so we went ahead and we put him on steroids we started the tmp smx but by 6 we real day 6 we realized that it wasn't just that it was also pcp pneumonia which basically you know is a life threatening condition and sadly by day 10 Mr Lannister had uh, you know decided to go DNI and DNR and he did not make it but uh, you know it was already too late for him and you know this is what we you know concluded in the end that he was a case of cryptogenic organizing pneumonia as well as pgp pneumonia that's a very sad case Samrish and I'm really really uh, you know somebody who's this immunocompromised when they get this sick their prognosis is not great and i really admire what you did i think at the end of the day when you're reminding us that in real life it's not so much about what the diagnosis is but the number of diagnoses a patient could have a really really educational case and ultimately i think based on this you can't argue with the diagnosis of pjp in a patient who has a pcr that's positive but i also think that the it was a wise move to start um corticosteroids because when you have rounded consolidations in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis that's very suggestive of organizing pneumonia and it turns out that infections are a notorious trigger for organizing pneumonia as is RA so um very very educational case amanda you are a grad soon to be graduating medical student and you in front of 40 people and many others on youtube are discussing a case of organizing pneumonia and pjp <laughs> pneumonia <laughs> how did it feel so it's a super new case to me no but it's a very interesting case because we have um uh, an autoimmune disease that it's that have a super like of the the disease that can occur similar and in the same time with uh with the disease and now we have um um uh, a final diagnosis that i never see so it's i, I love when this happens because i have what to study and i i want to know more about the final diagnosis i uh, and again you inspire us all as as is true every single time Um yeah I think I have a lot of reading to do too. Um and I'm excited to uh, reflect on this case with you all. Um hopefully in the future maybe in academy VMR. Um Ambish how did it feel to take care of this patient? So it was quite interesting the series of event that happened you know it was quite devastating for me to also watch the patient deteriorate I know I've been keeping a lighter tone by naming this you know patient Mr Lannister but for me I I was learning so much and you know watching somebody deteriorate so rapidly you know and seeing my team kind of almost feeling helpless by day 6 you know that we're doing so much we're putting him on broad spectrum you know we're putting him on steroids where we kind of almost diagnosed this patient but we you know we still could not save this patient for me at my you know at at a resident level you know i'm you know at that stage i i feel like for people like us it's very important to be mindful of cases like this that can present like community acquired pneumonia but they can in fact be you know something like cryptogenic organizing pneumonia and i had never seen you know a case of cryptogenic organizing pneumonia myself so for me it was a huge you know sort of learning uh, you know i i gained a lot from this case and then pjp pneumonia itself is a life threatening condition so i feel like you know these patients who are immunocompromised i mentioned how he was on humira for such a long time he had been immunocompromised so maybe that was sort of the nidus for the development of an opportunistic infection like pjp and then as dr rabi already mentioned you know i i and i learned that cryptogenic organizing pneumonia is sort of a manifestation of you know certain lung pathologies it could be idiopathic it could be due to immunocompromised states it could be triggered due to some infectious state so you know it was it was very very interesting but sadly you know this patient did not make it uh, but i i really wanted to you know share this case with you guys because it's it's a very special one no very well said and i'm really glad that you were able to share the learning for this patient and honor them and 
in passing on the wisdom and and hopefully um, helping us uh, uh, deliver similar high quality care that you did. And I think you're, uh, that's such a great formulation of organizing pneumonia. Organizing pneumonia is basically the HLH of the lung. It's basically you have an abnormal hyperinflammatory response that, that destroys your lungs and causes respiratory failure. But the trigger can be anything from unknown to infections. And no matter what the trigger is, if the patient is really, really sick, you have to stop the inflammatory cascade with steroids. And it's especially unfortunate when that inflammatory trigger is an infection. But in here, in this case, um, uh, the fact that it's PJP, um, uh, steroids in many cases of PJP are a good thing for the patient. And so I think that um, you're seeing the natural history of a dev devastating disease play. Um, Amanda, it was so cool to discuss with you. I think you were absolutely correct from the get-go. You said, I'm really worried this patient has an infection in their lung. And I think um, that's that turned out to be exactly right. And the new learning that you'll have about organizing pneumonia will prepare you for the next time it comes up. Amazing. All right, Mariana, take us home with the teaching points, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Ambish, for this amazing case. Thank you, Rabbi and Amanda, for this uh, outstanding discussion. It was really, really nice to learn with you guys today. So uh, I tried to summarize everything, but I I'm probably didn't get to do it that because there there are so many amazing teaching points so i'm going to start with the uh with the main teaching points so uh when you have a patient with shortness of breath we have to think in lung and heart and in this patient uh we had lack of orthopenia so we could think more in lungs and when you think about sob associated with fever we can think about infections and inflammatory disease and something really interesting in this case is that the patient also had an, uh, other complaints other than SOB. And at this moment, you have to uh, try to differentiate signal than noise because uh, you have complaints that are related to the current disease and uh, complaints that are like previous uh, complaints that you don't need to pay attention at this moment to do the right diagnosis. And this patient was on immunosuppression medication, so you have to think about opportunistic lung infections. And something amazing that I learned today is that um, when you have immunocompetent patients, you think about influenza and staph laureus and entomoeba and then also candida. And when you have immunocompromised patient, you still have to think about these conditions. And you, so you don't have to shift your diagnosis, but you have to expand it to another uh, causes like JC virus and toxoplasmos and PJP. And uh, about uh, the management of this patient here, uh, we could st start empiric antibiotics or wait for specific antibiotics uh, after the culture. But uh, in this patient, his pa this patient was too sick, so we should already start with empiric antibiotics. And we have to do that in two conditions. One, the, when the patient is too sick to wait for cultures, or if you are too, uh, too confident about the diagnosis. And these patients that are too sick are usually uh, the patient with sepsis or neutropenic fever, or uh, the patient that presents with rigors. Uh, in, in the x-ray of this patient, we had a patch of op opacification. We need to think about fluid, blood, and pus. And th this patient also presented with pans pancytopenia. Uh, so we have to think about infection causing bone, mar uh, bone marrow suppression or bone marrow suppression by itself. And we also have to consider felt syndrome in this patient because of the pancytopenia associated with previous diagnosis of rheumatic disease. And in the end, we had two main uh, differentials that was an unusual infection or inflammation to, into the lungs due to rheumatoid arthritis that uh, we call it here organizing pneumonia. Um, we had these two differentials and something that I, I wanted to say, I want to say here is that the organizing pneumonia can be a life-threatening uh, condition. So if you think about that for a patient, you should start on steroids. And uh, the diagnosis ended up being uh, the associated condition of uh, infection and organizing pneumonia. 
And that's what I have to for today. Oh, amazing. This was not easy, Mariana. This was not easy. And I think you did an absolutely amazing job. Um, I love that you kept the management reasoning in there in the, in the face of a very complicated diagnostic case. That was really cool. All right, y'all. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Um, you will see Prof. Rest back in action tomorrow for RLR, but I won't be there. Unfortunately, I have a uh, I have work at the time of EMR, but you're getting an upgrade because um, Prof. Rez is pairing up with Dr. Steph Sherman, um, the legendary Steph Sherman. So it'll be them two tomorrow. Um, I'll miss you guys, but I'm excited to see you all next week. Bye.